This video is about federalism, and we're going to talk about three different types of government. You might not believe it, but there's actually three governments that tell you sort of what to do and help you out in certain times, but you got three of them, and so we're going to talk about how the three different types of government that we live under can get along. So let's begin with a definition, and we will define federalism, which sounds like an extremely big, scary word. But don't be scared. Everything is going to be okay. It's actually very simple. Federalism is, is very simply a system of government where the powers of government, and you can think of a power like a job, something it's able to do, are split up between different levels of government. So our three levels of government that exist are national, state, and local. So our national governments in Washington, D.C., we have a Connecticut state government, and we also have a local government that runs the town of Ellington. All three of these governments have certain jobs, and what jobs they have are um, set up by our federal system. So you might be thinking, with three types of government, who does what? And that's an excellent question that federalism solves. So let's continue on here and talk a little bit more about how it works. The Constitution makes it happen. So you might think that with three different governments, they'd be like kind of stepping all over each other. That's not necessarily the case because our federal government is set up in the Constitution. And the Constitution says exactly what the national government can do. It says what powers it has. And it also says exactly what powers the state government has. So it makes it pretty simple because it says you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. It basically divides it up. And that's what federalism is. To make our system even clearer, our state constitutions, um, so the state of Connecticut has its own constitution for our state and how our state government works, and then it tells the towns what their job is. So the constitutions really make federalism very clear as to which part of government does which job. So how could you figure this out? Like if you wanted to look in the constitution, like what would it look like and how would you figure out what part of the government did what? The Constitution is organized into things called articles and sections. You can think of an article like a chapter. So if you're reading a chapter, um, you would expect it to be on one specific like, big topic. And a section is sort of like a sub-chapter or subheading, where you might think of a section like very, very specific. All the sections in an article are about the same topic, and the article is the topic. So we're going to be looking at, at five different sections of the Constitution in depth over the next few days. Article 1, Section 8 and 9, that is the, the job that the national government has in Section 8, and then Article 1, Section 9 is things that the national government can't do. Then in Article 1, Section 10, it denies powers to state government. In Article 2, Section 2, it tells about what the president can do, and then Article 4 is all about what state government can do. So that's how federalism works, and you can see exactly what state and national government can and cannot do in these articles here. And we're going to be practicing this all in class, so you're not expected to know or memorize this in any way. Just giving you a little overview that you'll be going through these sections of the Constitution to see what they say. So a couple things you need to know about federalism, because you might start thinking about, wow, there's lots of government, and how do they sort of like figure out who does what? And like, even though the Constitution says um, there must be some overlap, and you are right. So, the one thing that you need to know about is this term called concurrent powers. There are some jobs that the national and state government share, but they both have. Unfortunately for us, one of those jobs is taxing. The national government taxes us, and the state taxes us. So, that's a shared power. Both governments can create roads, both governments can charter banks, which means create banks for, the, for their area. There's tons more things that they can do. Now you might be thinking next, what happens when they differ? So like what if one, if they have a concurrent power and the state makes one law and the national government makes one law but they're different? The Constitution thought of that and it included this thing called the Supremacy Clause. And the Supremacy Clause, very simple says that all laws of national government are supreme. So in a conflict, the national law wins. So if there's any difference between a state and a national law because it's concurrent, the national law always wins out. Here is a very simple Venn diagram that might help you visualize what this would look like. You have a bunch of 
powers given to federal government. You have a bunch of powers given to state government. And then in the middle, you have some powers that both have, like taxing and many other things as well. So moving on here, I do want to cover a little bit of vocabulary that you're going to encounter when you start to look at the Constitution. And most of, when you start looking at the Constitution in class, you're going to notice that most of the jobs that Congress has that are listed in Article 1, Section 8, they're very specific. It's going to say, like, declare war, collect taxes. They're pretty much bullet points. But there are a couple of broad things in Article 1, Section 8 that require some explanation. The most important of those things is called the Necessary and Proper Clause. It's actually the last thing in Article 1, Section 8. So you can picture like this big list of jobs that Congress has, and then at the end, it says something extremely broad. Congress can make all laws that are necessary and proper. Well, that basically means they can do anything, right? If you can make it necessary and proper, well, then you can do it. So that's a very debatable part of the Constitution. This is also called the elastic clause, because you could think that Congress could stretch the meaning of this to fit what they needed to do. The necessary and proper clause makes Congress much, much more powerful when you consider necessary and proper can mean just about anything. There's also an important clause called the commerce clause, and I'm not going to get too much into this, and we're not going to cover this too much in class. I just wanted to mention it because it's a big one nowadays. It wasn't so much back in the time period we're studying. But it basically says Congress can regulate commerce with other nations in between states, which seems pretty self-explanatory, but they've actually expanded what this means nowadays. And President Obama and, and Congress used the Commerce Clause to create Obamacare, which was the health care reform. So that was their reason for it. I'm not going to get into how they did that, but you can just to give you an example, that's how broad the Commerce Clause has become as well. So uh, a few more vocab words and then we'll be done. So there's also a section in the Constitution that talks about the powers that, what it can't do. So there's three in particular I want to talk about because they're funny words. The first one is called an ex post facto law. This is forbidden. Congress cannot make ex post facto laws. And an ex post facto law is very simply a law that changes the rules um, that were committed prior to something happening. So in an ex post facto law, like if you were speeding and the fine was $100, but then like two weeks after you were speeding, they changed the fine to $200, you can't pay, you wouldn't be required to pay $200 because the law was 100 when you broke it. Or, you know, I can't make a law saying that you can't get out of your seat and then punish you because you got out of your seat yesterday. That just doesn't make any sense. Another thing is called the writ of habeas corpus. This is a Latin word and Congress cannot take away the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus is very simply a person under arrest must be brought before a judge in a timely fashion. So you can't get put in jail and not told why you're there and be, be left there forever without any trial or being at least brought before a judge to make sure you're imprisoned fairly and for a, a, a major reason. The only time this would be taken away um, by Congress would be in times of war or like national disaster when they might need to arrest people without telling them just to make sure people are safe. But Congress can't take this away any other time. And the third thing I wanted to talk about in this particular section of things Congress can't do, it's called a, it's called a bill of attainder. It is a law declaring someone guilty of a crime. So basically they put this in the Constitution because they didn't want Congress to be the, the jury. You know, you can't just say, you're guilty, we're making a law saying that you're guilty. You have to go through the legal process of going to court. So Congress can't pass laws declaring guilt. That would make them far too powerful. And that is federalism in a brief little presentation. So we'll be working more with this in class and more with the vocab words that you learned in this presentation.